your pants. Yeah, let him go down there, Tyler. Oh, yeah. It's your power strip. Oh, my God. Jesus Christ. Oh, that is painful. All right, we need a portal to the system. You know what? We need, put a, we need money to put a professional in the budget. You have a lot of notes in mind. I don't know what he did. I know. You know what? Andy's not normally an agent of chaos, but tonight, this is nice. I have more. Do you need them? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I just won't be. Sorry, that's a lot. Don't cross. Are we good, uh, Maria? Yeah. We live? Yeah. Nice of you to tell us. Are we on mute? I told you. I Check, check. So should I sing? No. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the finance meeting. We are um, slowly, slowly moving forward uh, toward the end of our budget process, which is super exciting. After uh, over a dozen meetings, hearings, um, uh, committee meetings, we are now at the phase. It's a very exciting phase for the new council members. So this evening, we will discuss with the mayor and Andy, the comptroller, um, maybe some things we saw in the budget, some questions. It's very informal. Um, it's basically to get us to the point of next week, which Andy will be sending all council members a reminder to get amendments, proposed amendments, um, to Andy by Monday morning. Um, so we'll talk about that also. But without further ado, we'll open up the finance meeting and I will uh, ask Council Member Soriento to lead us in the pledge. Just okay. All right, so I think um, a really helpful, um, probably, um, tool for council members would be to take a look at the um, uh, committee reports that everyone did. Um, I first want to commend all my colleagues, really good reports. Um, you know, very thorough, um, but, you know, I figured we could work off those and, you know, maybe tackle some questions. Um, so, like I said, this is a discussion with the mayor and Andy. Um, what I would like to hit first, and Council Member um, Steele brought it up, is if you notice in the Finance Committee report when it came to the clerk's office, we had talked about the assistant clerk and that particular position. And um, I want to say about two months ago, the clerk um, sent a memo to council members 
Um, not so much, obviously, the person in that position is doing an incredibly uh, fabulous job, but it's more the position. And that position, if you look at similar positions in other departments, is woefully underpaid. Uh, so saying that, what I would like to do, and I'll get the amendment to Andy, um, but if you go to the clerk's office, which is page 45. Thank you, Sue. It was like a page okay. after that. Okay, so if you go to 43, yeah. Um, what I am going to propose, and there's no votes tonight, so don't feel pressured. There's nothing in writing. This is total discussion for us. So what I plan to do, um, a proposal myself, Council Member Galeen, Council Member Soriento, um, $5,000. And I went into accounts uh, 1410, 402, 403, 404, and 408. And what I did, the 404027, what I did, if you notice, our recommended proposal did not. Uh, take a 10% cut. So I'm, for for these lines, recommending a 10% decrease on top of another certain percentage. So for 402, the postage, if you notice, um, our current budget was 1,500. We proposed 18. In prior years, it really is around 11, 12. So I reduced that line by 600. So uh, 402, I reduced by 600. Printing and advertising, I reduced by 300. You'll see the prior year. Um, the 0027, the maintenance contract, um, I did bring down, Andy, and you could tell me. It looks like prior years, it was more like four grand, 4,200. Um, I'm proposing we take 600 from that to bring it to 4,400. And then um, 408, dues <coughs> and subscriptions, I'm bringing that down dramatically, um, taking 3,500 from that. If you look at prior years, we have not expended nearly the 8,500 that was uh, proposed last year. So that would come down to 6,500. That totals $5,000. Um, so, you know, my amendment will be to increase um, A1410101, the assistant city clerk, um, by 5K. And I think at least it gets that position in the high 30s, which really it should be. I mean, to be in the low 30s for that position, I would encourage any of you to, to sit um, and do, you know, if you want to do like an informal audit to see what the clerk's office does on an annual basis, you will find um, it's a super busy office. Yeah. Correct. So, and I'll send to everyone. So when I send it to Andy, I'll copy everyone. Um, so that's a big one. Um, and like I said, there's no vote tonight. Uh, it's more discussion. Um, the clerk did speak to the UPSU um, president, Chris Whalen. He does support um, this increase. So, so, you know, if we wanted to open it up, um, you know, one of the questions I did have, Mayor. So I looked at the non-rep policy and um, bear with me. So the non-reps, i.e., you know, the deputy mayor and others who are not um, in a position that um, is under a union, there was an agreement that was um, ratified, authorized, ratified by the mayor back in 20. 19, I believe. Um, I have a copy of it and I will share it with all of you. 
Um, it looks like, so in 2020, uh, Ordinance 9, it's um, a non-ramp agreement and it's a 35 pager. I will forward it to all of you, but I guess my big question on this, um, if you recall, we bumped up the deputy mayor by, I want to say maybe 10K. This is before the new council. I want to say like maybe two years ago. And then the bump went in for the non ramp. I guess, you know, my question, and this has like nothing personal with Chris or anything, um, but saying that the deputy mayor is proposed in the 2023 to have the salary, I believe, go up to 98, maybe? Bear with me, here we go, 94, I apologize. So 94,266. But if you look at the non-rep, I'm sorry, page 24, sorry. But if you look at the, Bear with me. Um, toward the end, the salaries, boop, boop, boop. the salary at this point for the deputy mayor um, for 2023. Shoot, hold on. Okay. So. Uh, Bear with me. I don't know if you have it in front of you, Andy. Um, but right. So now it it would it's ninety six forty, but it the proposed um is a four thousand dollar bump or you know thirty eight. But what I'm trying to find here we go. And I will tell you. So my point on this one is the deputy mayor in 2023, the salary was supposed to be 87,074 per the agreement. So the agreement has a 4% increase, but it's the total would be $87,784. So I guess, you know, and I get, you know, each year the 4%, and that's what's proposed here. But because we bumped it a couple years ago, it, it doesn't jive with obviously the columns in the non ramp. So I guess my question is are you still proposing that 4K for 2023? Yes. Um, what we did, or what you did a couple of years ago at our request was amend the, the schedule in the non-rep policy to bring that salary higher. And um, my recollection was that that was based on the fact that a number of people that the deputy mayor supervised made more than the deputy mayor. Um, and uh, that didn't feel right to a number of people. So that figure was amended. And what we're doing in the 23 budget is following the scheduled percent increases uh, for all non-rep individuals. So I believe that number for 2023 is 4%. It is 4%, but you know, like I said, it doesn't jive with obviously the total, the 87 in change. Right, because that was amended when when the salary was changed, much as you're proposing to do with the assistant um, clerk's position. Um, you know what, Mayor? I guess, you know, while we're in your department, do you plan um, to try to find a deputy director of public info? Or do you think with, um, you know, the bump and the salary that the deputy mayor would uh, be capable of you know, doing the press releases and things like that. Well, I don't think um, the four percent increase of the deputy mayor's salary puts any more hours in his day. So, yes, we're still looking to um, hire somebody to do uh, the public information, which has been um, suffering without anybody in that position. So, we've spoken to a few individuals 
um, and we're guardedly optimistic that we can fill that position. Okay. And um, Mayor, how's the director of uh, the diversity, equality, and in inclusion? How's that process of finding someone doing? Well, I have a candidate who I'm very interested in, but I, I did want to make sure it got through the budget process this year. Gotcha. I have, you know, no intention to to take away that position as uh, last year we didn't either. Okay. Um, I'll open up for council members, just questions. Um, yes, council member Figueroa. Just, uh, um, I was looking at page 147 for the uh, general services you borrow um, I do see that we have a total of 91,530. That position was just filled. Mm -hmm. Um, what, uh, is that the only thing that we spend on the, um, youth services, just manpower and like, what, what do they do? What are they in charge of in the city and kind of description wise? So like. Basically, we paid them to do what? That's uh, that was my question. Sure. Um, so that the youth services position, we had one individual, right? We just hired the second person. Um, that's one of the areas that we've been looking at this summer. They've been really supporting activities in the parks, and whether they're not for profits. Uh, we're having conversations about how they continue to support them. We're having conversations. Uh, we're gonna meet with CEO to talk about the SU CERT uh, advisory committee as well uh, to see how they can assist with that group. Um, and then we'll be lining out a plan for the coming year. So we did, I think uh, we're getting information on what they've accomplished over the prior year. I think that information sent, was sent over to you, Andy. Um, was that, do you know? Not yet? Okay. Yeah. Um, you be they they might have prepared a draft. Yeah, that, that information was is being prepared for the council uh, in response to the uh, recreation meeting that we had a, a few weeks ago now. Um, and that kind of outlined some of the things for this year. But um, yeah, it's one of the areas that we're, we're looking at. Um, I think the other question you had, um, in addition to man hours, uh, what additional support do they need? Um, you know, that's one of the questions that I have, and it might be a conversation at, you know, mid-year or at least going into next year to see if there's some additional financial support that should go to supporting initiatives that are run through the youth services program um, to, to help to run events or activities, you know, for example, at the various city parks. You know, I'm thinking we had a great meeting at Lots of Hope uh, with the youth, youth advisor at the time um, about park improvements, et cetera. Um, there were requests, uh, you know, how can we do some more programming for our youth in that park? Um, we found external funding sources to help to accomplish those uh, for the summer, but maybe there's something else we should be looking at. And Council Member Figueroa, I'm really glad that you asked that question because, um, you know, there were some emails that were flying around last week. And, you know, I think from you know, we're at least, you know, I said, you said, we're just curious um, what and how they're going to interact with the community and, you know, um, their new position. So the opportunity is, is there to really um, use these positions to really create, you know, new partnerships with organizations and I, you know, I'm not really sure what the youth specialist did over the last year. Right, yeah. Well, so, yes. Yeah. Yep. And, and again, you know, I, as you guys know, I'm passionate about the youth and I think, and we go, and we all know, like, all the violence and everything that's going on, it's predominantly the young people. So I would definitely like to be behind this and see how we can make this department stronger, right? Yeah. And And how we can give them more resources and the tools they need to be effective in the community. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Did anyone, um, you know what, Council Member Conley Wilson, um, I was unable 
to attend the IT. And I was curious, during the IT, did you guys talk at all about the uh, one position, the data communication analyst? Um, so I can yeah. speak to that if that's okay. Yeah. Um, and if uh, the mayor has anything else to add. So I recently talked to um, Quinn and that position was actually filled um, recently. Um, so they, so he was able to find someone for that. And I believe what Quinn was explaining to me was that he would be helping roll out some of the um, infrastructure updates that need to happen across the city and all that. So that's a, I think a very valuable position we need. And so that position was filled, yeah, because our last vacancy it was- wasn't filled it was, during yeah. meeting. Gotcha. Yeah, that position was, uh, the person just started last week. Um, and I just want to add that we were very lucky to find somebody with a, a rich history in programming uh, and networking. Um, so he'll be able to assist Quinn and others within the IT office with uh, supporting our staff and city operations. Um, but we were really, really lucky to find the person we did. Um, Mayor, the um, collective bargaining, obviously, um, you know, we're, we all get uh, that the I, I think the majority of the contracts end the end of this year. No. Um, what are, yeah, what are the timelines only? So I know UFA is uh, 1231 this year, UFCA. Okay. 1231. Uh, 1231. CSCA is. Uh, UF, UFA, UFCA, and COPE all expired December 31st, 2023. 2022, PBA expires December 31st, 23. CSCA expires 1231, 20. Council member. Council member, go. That's all off memory. <laughs> Cope, UFA, UFCA expire at the end of the year, 2022. Okay. Yeah. Okay. PBA, 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 I'm pulling up my table. PBA expires December 31st, 2023. CSEA expires December 31st, 2024. UPSU expires December 31st, 2023. Okay. So um, the comptroller's letter, I mean, uh, they made it sound like all of them were expiring, but really the fire is the big one. Yes. Yep. Okay. And UPSU was when, Andy, I apologize. 23. 23. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. Now, Andy, this is a question. So Council Member Gully and I were talking about the garbage uh, fund increase. You know, obviously it's a huge sticking point and we won't <laughs> go down that road. But um, say we were able to find um, savings in the general fund. Would it be prudent to interfund transfer and bring that 33 increase down? Is that my opinion? Do you want my opinion on that or well, what you're allowed to do? Because those are two very different okay, answers. Okay, why don't you tell us both? So yes, you can do it. Okay. My response to that is don't do it. And the reason why I'm going to say don't do it is... If I recall correctly, almost 50% of the fee increase from 2021 to 2022 was because, and no offense to the then city council, that's what the then city council did in 2021, is the assessment update was removed for $125,000 and replaced as an interfund transfer to the garbage fund. And when that was not there the following year, we saw what happened with the fee. That's my opinion about it. That's... Yeah. It's something to be very cognizant of. Is it's a one-time bandage, and that's it, it's, it's, there's no other way to put that. Okay. okay, that's why we're doing this. I think it 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 just kicks the can down the road, and we've been trying for years to avoid doing that anymore because we recognize that that's how um, we got into trouble twenty some years ago, and um, 
you know, we saw the big increase after that one time infusion um, from the general fund uh, help, helped underwrite the garbage fund. And that that's what happens. You, you end up dealing with it, you know, pay me today or pay me tomorrow. It's, it's one of those situations. Um, you know, in speaking of, you know, the garbage fund, Noel, do we, and can the council, I had, uh, you know, sent a request for ARPA funds. And Chris, the reason I did that is especially for the new folks who weren't part of the first tranche being approved. Um, the reason I did that obviously was to get an idea, okay, you know, A, B, and C was appropriate parks money, um, you know, the RFP city hall, RFP for the staffing, and then fast forward to the second tranche, but the first tranche, the American theater, et cetera. So what I'd like, and I think other council members, I don't want to speak for you, but just where they are, um, if it's looking that we're not going to go through with that project, obviously, but you know where we are with the project, like the American theater, I'm hearing rumors, I don't know the truth, you know, things like that. So if you could give us a timeline, I think that that would be really helpful. And then what has been spent to date? Yeah, we're working on an update. Um, we're also continually adding information to the website. Uh, I can't remember if I responded to the email last week. Apologies if I didn't. Um, our focus right now has been on premium pay and trying to get those contracts signed and the complexities around them. Um, once we're through that, through the turkey trot, uh, you know, leading into December, we're going to provide some more information on, on an update on the ARPA funds. Uh, American Theater, you know, I'll cover that one very briefly. Um, they had a DRI request. So there's a number of programs that were approved for ARPA or that were in the latest tranche request um, that are also connected with what the state's going to do with DRI. So we're in the process of asking, asking New York State where, that, where the DRI announcement, what they think is going to happen. We probably won't find out till the day of or the day before. Um, they like to keep those things very close to the vest, um, but there are a number of those pieces that are contingent on what's going to happen with the state funding. That's a good point. Um, but we're yeah. looking on updates and also, really importantly, also getting that information out uh, onto the ARPA website. I don't know if you noticed, but the tranche two, the $5 million is now listed on the website. Um, there's listings of every single application that were received, um, as you know, and then a graphic associated with the $5 million that just went out the door. Um, so there's more things that are going to be received as far as or visible as the public out there. And the second tranche, Chris, um, what's the timeline to try to get agreements with many of those nonprofits? I'm trying to do that as soon as possible. So hopefully we'll have news in the, in the coming weeks. And Mayor, do if, you envision... If I, if I could just add oh, to that, I, yeah. think, I, I think it's going to depend upon the recipient. So some organizations or some recipients are more sophisticated um, and or they may have a single, uh, a, a grant for a single purpose like replacement of an HVAC system. That's real easy. Um, other grants that have more program related expenses or other recipients that didn't get 100% of what they asked for and now we have to renegotiate the work plan and what ARPA will fund, that will take a little bit more time. But I would say that the only thing we can say for certain is that nothing's really for certain until we sit down with each group and work out um, the timeline for them. And, you know, and I totally get like, especially the second tranche. Um, the first, uh, I did hear that the LDC seems to be moving forward with the business grant uh, program. Is that accurate? We have a proposal that we've been batting around and the question becomes, do we, um, administer it in-house, uh, or do we um, work with somebody who has underwriting capacity? Again, I, I'm reticent to build staff capacity here that we don't currently have um, because this is a one-time deal and um, then we're stuck with those expenses. So, and I'd rather see more money go out on the street, frankly. But, um, you know, we may, we, we may approach another organization that has um, capacity and experience in administering uh, business loans or business grants yes. and work with them under criteria that we develop. And when we talked about the, the this 
grant program, we actually talked we wanted to be grants, not loans. And yeah. I recall that conversation. Yeah. And, yep. That theoretically would be nice to have a revolving loan program, but the, the requirements are so onerous right. um, that we, you know, with this small um, of an amount of money, um, I don't know if it would generate enough um, interest revenue uh, right. to support the, the overhead of running the program. Plus, it would be income on ARPA funds, and Andy, I'm sure, has an opinion on that. That would make it even more difficult. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and just on that note, so are you thinking maybe the LDC not um, be the, uh, the agency? Because, obviously, when we passed it, we had said uh, the LDC. Well, there may be aspects of it that the LDC is involved in. Um, application, I mean, program design. Program design should be a city function, not a subcontractor's function. Uh, but the mechanics of receiving applications, uh, meeting with applicants, underwriting the applications, uh, determining what, if any, additional support the applicants might need that might be augmented from a different source, um, that is something that could be done outside of the organization, outside of the city organization. But it would still be up to us to say yes, no, um, but somebody would come in with that uh, background information, having done the, the due diligence for us. And uh, do you know where we are with a uh, trip? Do we have a contract with them for the home ownership um, program? So I've met with uh, trip a number of times and uh, we are putting together what that program will look like. It's, it's you know, uh, more complicated than I would have hoped, but the pre-work that we're doing, uh, I think, is going to be beneficial with the goal. Uh, our timeline internally, very roughly, is for a program to roll out in the spring um, so people could take advantage of it during the summer. Yep. Good. 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 Okay. Uh, Council President. Yep. Council Member Men. Yeah. Um, I think it would be very helpful because there are so many questions coming from the community and there is the previous work from the previous council that a quarterly update would be very helpful on ARPA, where we are, how programs are developing, where contracts are, um, you know, cause we're getting those questions regularly. And, you know, even knowing as things get more granular, where to direct people. So at what point in time, when we have a small business coming to us looking for a grant, because they've heard or they've gone back and or or we're at one of those meetings sending them to the right person and at what point in time is that person rather than just constantly deputy mayor mayor's office you know yeah and i think that's some of the information you know with the small business program once we've lined out what it looks like uh, that information will go on the troy now website so that's where we've been updating troy now as programs have been coming online with either information about it. Um, you know, that one, the public art initiative, uh, you know, those are ones where you'll, I really wanna have a single point of contact for businesses or individuals to reach out to, yes. um, you know, and that will have a committee of sorts that will review applications as well. Uh, as far as ongoing information, we want information, you know, my goal is to get the information out there uh, more than quarterly even, um, we do, post the quarterly reports that are submitted to the feds um, as far as where the ARPA dollars have gone. Um, but then we've also been adding information and also trying to add it in a way that um, is easy to digest. And that's where you see the graphics um, that have come out. So there's the one that shows the 5 million. There's the one that shows the funding to date. Because um, you know my big piece as far as the public information is you know, let's not just give them a list, give them something that is easy to digest. Um, so yeah, we, we can certainly add more information to the website, but I, I agree with you, um, as the programs line out, we'll try to have a direct point of contact. Um, and it does definitely does not need to be me. Um, and it shouldn't be you. It should be the point of contact. That's the subject matter expert in the, with the various field. Um, and that's where we've got great partners with the LDC potentially, you know, depending on if they run the program or farm it out a little, um, with trip, uh, a great partnership there with the art center, great partnership there. Uh, that's really the, you know, the joy is the council that was here before and the administration have worked to bring the right people to the table uh, for the community to inter interact with. Um, and, you know, I think uh, just getting back to the 
comment about the tranche two, the 15 applications. Uh, my goal in the coming weeks is for us to have outreach to the each recipient with what the next steps are and what information we need to them, uh, give to them. So that's why the, we don't have that, all of that lined out yet. Um, I didn't want to give partial information, but we'll have that information for the 15. Now, when a contract gets signed, you know, as the mayor alluded to, that can you know, partially depend on the sophistication of each different entity. Um, and I guess it also begs the question of, you know, looking at a legal department budget and needing more lawyers on staff and where we are with hiring a deputy corporate counsel. Because, I mean, obviously there are plenty of lawyers that we can outsource things to, but it does, it is probably more cost effective to do it in-house. And then we have that continuity as well. So, uh, you know, we're still struggling to um, uh, bring in legal counsel. And um, uh, frankly, I think one of the challenges is we're looking at a one year time horizon um, and uh, you're looking for somebody who is experienced um, and is willing to give up where they are now, where they've gotten that experience. Um, presumably they're high quality because we don't really want to hire somebody that's not high quality. Um, so we're asking them to, to vacate their current position and come here with no more than a 12-month guarantee. So it, it is something that is um, inherently challenging, and uh, we continue to have those conversations and talk to people. That's probably all I want to say uh, right now. Are you all set? Council Member Gully. So, question. I know I mentioned it before, and I'll just mention it again. Is that better for the crowd out there? All right, thank you. Can you hear me in the back of the room? All right, thank you. Um, you know, on that thought, we talked about possibly having like our corporate counsel and having be the point guy to maybe finding a a um, a conglomeration of attorneys or a business that would be able to handle the different facets of municipal uh, law for us. Has there been any consideration to that? Um, where, where we have our like our, our lead guy, our point guy who handles all of our our legal processes through a company that we subcontract and we keep on retainer for this way one company can cover all the different aspects and how would that be um, cost wise? I think we've done that already to some degree, and then the problem we're faced with is that even when it's been done, uh, we still have had other attorneys mandated upon the city. Uh, several years ago, before Rick became Corporation Counsel, we had done an RFP for general tort, which is your general law cases. We put one out separately for bankruptcy, and we put one out, I think we put a third one out for another matter. And labor, we put all three out at the same time. Um, Patterson, Sampson, Ginsburg was awarded the general tort. Marenstein and Marenstein was awarded bankruptcy. Marenstein and Marenstein had the was the highest scored firm, specializes in bankruptcy, and was the least expensive of that. Um, multiple firms responded to labor, and it was awarded to Goldberg and Segala. Uh, bond counsel has been bond Shenick and King for a variety of reasons, and say we they're all been procured. And then the city's insurance company, under the policy, has the right and exercise that right to force, and no offense to this law firm, but this is what they forced the city to engage with a specific law firm for certain cases. So you can still procure all that, but what your insurance company reserves the right to tell you who your lawyer is. And I truly understand that under litigation and certain situations, but I'm just trying to find a way to possibly alleviate some of the extenuating time it takes to get uh, legislation and paperwork out of the attorney's office because he's so overwhelmed. And, and I think that, that, you know, maybe you gotta have three eyes on that to figure out how we can kind of make that a more efficient process because sometimes great projects and great pieces can get held up by small pieces of paper and we don't want to fall into that realm. So I'm just thinking, even if you have the separate, 
do we cover enough or is there somebody we can get that would that would be able to cover some of that extensive volume of of paperwork involved and not necessarily checking the eyes and crossing teeth because we know rick is phenomenal at that but just trying to help him get some sort of relief there so that he's not so overwhelmed with the work uh, by using an outside firm that might help and just you know and i know it doesn't matter whether it's people who are specialized in each area or one firm law firm that would do the whole thing but just how do we help his apartment his department if he says he can't get additional help because we can't pay more maybe we should look at how we utilize a consultant money in that department which is very high and maybe we should look to kind of you know see how we could kind of fix that little bit of a glitch that we have um in getting things uh you know procured and quickly in a fashionable time i guess Be easy I, I, I think I'm not no, 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 no. I think I think one thing that the council could do that could facilitate this is um, change the procurement policy. Uh, there's not another municipality that we're aware of uh, that requires procurement for legal services. Legal services are um, services that are um, unique um, and uh, very specific these days. You don't see too many generalists. Same in same in uh, medicine. I mean, you wouldn't go to an orthopedist um, to have your eyes checked. Uh, you go to the specialist in that particular field. Our procurement policy requires that we go through a procurement process for legal services. And that's a long process. And I understand that it's designed to protect the taxpayer. But the fact of the matter is things happen in law uh, under very tight deadlines that can't be met uh, through a procurement process. Um, most municipalities, well, every municipality, every uh, level of government that I'm aware of allows its corporation council's office to make determinations as to who is the best firm to represent the municipality in a particular setting. And that trust is given to the corporation council uh, because the corporation council is, is probably the, well, is the best suited uh, person to make that determination for the taxpayer's benefit. So I think that would help a little bit um, uh, and every little bit would be important. So in, in, in looking at that and in looking to change a procurement policy, what type of verbiage could be processed to protect the taxpayer from an overindulgence of consultants and we use them when we need them, just not when we want them? What would protect that? What would protect that value to the taxpayers if you were to look at that at changing the procurement policy? Well, the, the council's oversight of the budget, the mayor's oversight of the corporation council um, would give you the same protections that you have now. Because when we come forward with um, a proposal for legal services, whose opinion do you rely on now? Corporation right. councils. Right. So they bring the one who, who they feel is best suited to represent the city. I don't know that the taxpayer in a situation like this gets any better protection um, because of our procurement policy, at least when it comes to legal representation. Okay, thank you, appreciate the answers. And you know, on that you now, I, I had thought a couple of quick things. Um, I, I don't see a, a problem with the procurement policy only because when I thought that we had a pool of attorneys, for instance, the Patterson Law Firm and others, like on a retainer or as needed. So we do have a pool of attorneys. That had been the plan. And then the other awarding company went out of business. Wait, what was that? I don't remember the yeah, name of the firm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But, but there's also even. Um, even the largest firm has gaps. You know, there are particular areas where they may not have an expertise or their expertise may be weaker than the guy across the hall. Um, so for example, we were uh, sued by um, the what is it, disabilities rights. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we didn't have anybody in our stable that had expertise in that area. So we had to go out and get somebody else for that. Um, so, and it, it, it's just crazy, uh, the number of different, uh, disciplines, um, 
legal disciplines that come into play in municipal operations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know Jeff worked really hard with the administration on um, the RFPs and, you know, and that process. So um, I see you laughing, Andy. Okay. Anyone else uh, questions? Um, yes, Council Member Figueroa. Um, what well, has to do with another? Did you sure. still have? Yeah, go for it. Um, I just wanted to see where we at with an update in regards to. I want to go to traffic. Mm -hmm. Um, I know in North Central, um, the Kip School. We've been looking at that location in regards to traffic and money to see if we can put some kind of sign there. Um, I've also spoke to them today, so I don't know where we was at and um, an update on that. So we've spoken with the KIPP school as well. Um, we did put up the no parking signs uh, during the morning at the request, um, and that's to allow parents to drop off kids uh, during the morning. They didn't need it in the afternoon time period. Um, we are also looking at school zone signs. Um, we are working through the procurement of those signs right now. So we've hit a couple of hurdles um, and we're going to be working through the procurement of those. But the goal is still to, to put those signs up. Okay, Will they look similar to like the ones like on Oakwood that, that was just put up? I need to. I think, I think most, I know the no parking is there, but I think it's more of traffic safety, the people speeding during the school time and stuff like that. And yeah, and I know we've yeah. also, I, I don't, I can get the specifications for the signs um, and how they compare to others in the city. We can look at that. Right. Um, I know we've also spoken with the police department and they've had officers there at times to, to reduce speeding and other activities like that. We, we've done those in different focus areas in the city. Okay. And coincidentally, council member, um, I was down there this evening before coming over for the turkey uh, dinners, which blew me away. Yeah, 600. Yeah, it, it's unreal what they do there. But um, Kate did bring me outside and mention um, that you were down there also. So I said, whatever help. And Chris, obviously, yeah. I know that you're working just, with I them. Also. Yeah. Well. yeah. Yep. I know it's been a while. I should also mention that um, through the in conversations with Kate, Kip has actually offered to pay for the signs. Um, so you know that's an added benefit to the city, um, and it, it's something we really do want to move forward with quickly. Um, and we'll be working to move forward. With that you know, my goal is to get that done quickly. Okay. Um, so we figure out what the exact procurement issues are. Thanks, Council Member Gully. Is that? Is that the same school that the incident where the four-year-old ran out into the road? The yes. other side. The other okay. side on River Street. Yeah. Yeah, River. Does, does yeah. the school system or the school provide like a crossing guard or somebody there or to protect the kids when they come out of school? Or is it just? Um, I, I can I can attest. So I did have a conversation with her. They are looking into the um, to how Albany runs it because yes. Albany do have school yep. crossing guards. Um, they do have like a budget, so they they kind of like looking at the statistics. How does that? How is it run? Well, maybe they can look like a shared services, so they can get yeah. You know, so they can all work to get better pricing. Because I had asked more often. Kate about it um, in yeah. regards to school crossing guards, which is a lot of help. Um, yeah. yeah. So they they I know they are looking into that. That's if, cool. If That's I great. mean, she actually Kate mentioned tonight they're hiring someone within the next couple of weeks yeah. that. Won't be like a full fledged SRO. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And yeah. she said that that'll help, yeah. you know. But Resco what are they Re school resource, resource office. It'll be a resource so person. It's similar yeah. to school resource I think that's office. great. It should be in every school. Yeah. 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 Yep. Uh, council president. Yes, council member men. Well, and dovetailing into that in terms of because, and this may be something that is you're fleshing out the youth services positions working with the public schools, public and private schools, um, because I know the concerns about and are from both RPI students as well as parents at Troy High, Troy Middle, striping the sidewalks, um, you know, like a, 
like lighted signage warning pedestrian crossing um that you know in my conversation with bill wrangler he said that that is striping painting is stuff that the school district does have and it's sometimes a matter of coordination um and just sort of have teasing out those relationships i mean that certainly yeah and i so kip's a good example um but, and then I'll switch to uh, Troy High. Um, with KIPP, you know, they're going to pay for the signs. Um, we went and did the striping. We were also doing paving already. So that was included within it. Um, up, um, you know, on Burdett, uh, we did go through and do the striping. We're working with RPI to put in the flashing signs. Um, so it, it's a partnership. Um, we know there are areas that we need to look at, <clears throat> and I hope that we can look at, you know, other school areas throughout the city, um, you know, and we're just going to knock away at them one by one. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, that is one area that we've heard about a number of times. Yeah. Well, the striping, I mean, was miserably years, you know, behind. And, you know, now I think we're kind of in catch up mode, but saying that, around a number of our schools, um, both private and public, mm -hmm. um, the striping needs to still happen. You yeah. know? And I'm sure as you know, we ran into the issue in 2021 where no one in the country could find paint. Yep. Um, and then in 2022, uh, we were waiting for our new machine to arrive. Um, and then we had a worker uh, who was out. Um, and as you know, I mean, just talking to Billy Wangler, we, we run a tight ship uh, and a nimble staff, but almost too small at times. So when he loses one of the employees, it means that some things don't get done um, as much as we tried to make those a priority. Um, so we'll continue to knock away at them. I agree with, you know, uh, because of the lack of paint and the waiting on the machine, there, there is a huge unmet need um, that we'll look to uh, start addressing in 2023, especially. Uh, we can't do anything right now, of course, because of the cold weather. Council President. Yes. Council um, so how do, how does that how does that look for KIP? Um, right. They said they were willing to pay for the signs. Is it a proposal mm -hmm. that they submit to engineering, to to um, city council? How, how does that? So I had connect them yeah. connected them with the city engineer, okay. um, but with Aaron leaving, I'll be taking that project okay. over essentially for the next steps to figure out uh, the process proceeding. Okay. Thank you. Council yes, Council Member Min. Um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that from the previous deputy mayor, there was a pool of money for parks okay. that was under the deputy mayor's office. Is that correct? No. Mm -hmm. okay. No. I, I think it led to tree trimming at Parker Park, and that was sort of under Monica's jurisdiction. <laughs> We had appropriated money in the capital projects fund specific to Barker Park. Gotcha. So it was administered through capital, the capital fund. For that Barker Park, yes. The park improvements, okay. the other pot, yes. There's no appropriation in the mayor's, the deputy mayor is under the mayor's office budget. There's no appropriation in the mayor's office budget for park right. improvements. Okay. Well, that makes the Thank you. Um, speaking of um, parts, Chris and Andy, um, when you work on that timeline, et cetera, if you could let the council know what's been expended to date on what, what are next steps. I mean, it, it's very, very frustrating. I mean, I'm not going to go down that road and, you know, express my frustration, but I'm very, very frustrated how we don't have shuttles in the ground. So I'm not pointing my finger at you, even <laughs> though I'm lucky. Even though I'm lucky. Come on, you and I, we'll go out there. Let's go do it. Machine gun. Let's get a backup. Let's get a backup. Um, Council Member Gully, before we maybe start concluding, do you want to talk about the parking at all? Parking for? The oh, the department. parking attendant? You know, no, no, because you know how I see it. Yeah. I said at the meeting, we don't need to hash this out again. Yeah. I just think it's unrealistic right now when you guys can put together a job criteria and job duty spec that would fit your needs 
and we could bring somebody in part time to do that job without the long term impact to the taxpayers. I just think it's we're just not there yet. In fact, what I really think I see in the future is where Troy starts to slim down on parking in the city and makes alternative travel through the city more city more popular because this is a walkable, a walkable, viable, uh, tight city yes. that you could create that in your downtown. So what I don't want to do is do something now that long term isn't conducive or financially a value to the taxpayers down the road. And I think you could get the same amount of the same amount of production out of that position um, doing it the right way. My, well, I don't know if mine's right. Just my opinion. I'm not an expert on this, but that's how I feel. And I've already mm -hmm. said it once, so we're done. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is what it is. I think it's you know what I'm going to propose, so it is what it is. Right. I, I just I think, think it's fair And Council President. Council Member Man. Yeah. I mean, one of the biggest complaints I get is over-enforcement of parking in downtown. It's shooting fish in a, in a barrel. And unfortunately, it very much has, it does, over-enforcement is leading to businesses losing staff and losing business. Um, and I know that there's this balance, you know, spots opening up and, and Sam Grouch is pop, 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 pop. And I would very much like our parking de department to work closely with the mayor's office um, and, and, and especially in downtown bid to approach the state to do a resident parking permit process because for folks who work nine to five or have their, their business or live downtown and park, it's not so much the during the day, it's the alternate overnight side parking on first street between the state and, you know, very narrow things where people get nailed over and over and over, but not consistent. So sometimes it's enforced and sometimes it's not. And if it were consistent in either way, people would be much happier. Like, tolerant. Tol tolerant. You're right. <laughs> not they're never gonna oh. they're not happy. But you know, this is one of those things they know we have to go to the state for that. And I know that it's not an easy process. Um, but um I think it's something that at least I I, I believe it's been started in the past. Mm -hmm. And if we can you know, go back and revisit that. Um, I think that that's going to be something. It, there is parking enforcement brings in money to us, but it also has a negative impact when you start losing your sales tax revenue because people can't come and or they can't keep their businesses open because they can't have staff because there's no place for their staff to park. Um, and I would also like to say, I don't know that because it may be a criminal a criminal complaint rather than a civil complaint. And so it may not be appropriate for parking enforcement, but to ticket for double parking, um, because double parking not only creates an unsafe condition, blocking traffic, sometimes a quarter mile uh, if you double park on third street. And that means EMS can't get through, normal people can't get through, buses can't get through, people don't get to work on time. Um, and what we've seen with what rise of like deliveries and double parking for that. And it's, it's just the people are not ticketed for that. And I, and I know it's endemic throats, but you know, as we're looking for other revenue sources, double parking tickets and double the fee. I'm going to guess that the businesses that are complaining about, um, Parking are the same ones that complained when we allowed parking all day because their uh, customers couldn't get in, couldn't find a parking spot. So they were finding it much easier to go to Colony. Sometimes um, this, is a, this is a balancing act. And, uh, you know, we're, we are, we do have a residential concentration in downtown Troy, but we also have a, a concentration of service providers, I mean, lawyers, uh, banks. Uh, retail, restaurants, et cetera, who depend upon uh, street parking for their customers. Um, I got an earful when we uh, started enforcing uh, parking a few years back from a merchant um, who six months later was delighted um, because she had 
because our customers were coming in and saying, oh, it's so much easier to park down here now. So I don't, you know, we can look at residential parking, but I would advise against it, but I'm not a planner. I, I will refer to the planning uh, department to look at, but if we start getting complaints from the merchants because all the residents are parking downtown, then I'm going to give them your number. They already um, have it. Yeah. <laughs> they already have it. Don't yeah, worry. it's it's a it's a balance, it's a tough balancing act, and a double parking is a pet peeve of mine. But because our uh, um, our uh, uh, parking enforcement individuals are part time and work defined hours, um, anything outside of that time frame, you know, I, I go home by the liquor store on Ferry Street every night. I go buy it, um, and it, there's always somebody double. There and I want to call somebody, but there's nobody work. There's nobody in parking enforcement that works at night. Um, so you know we do need flexibility in terms of um, uh, longer days for parking attendants. But um, yeah, uh, double parking seems to be. And the most irritating thing is when people double park next to an open parking spot because they aren't capable of parallel parking or they're too lazy. Um, yeah, it's it's. So yeah, parking's a problem. I'd love to be in a city that um, uh, didn't collect any fees for parking fines because they didn't need to. Um, we don't do this for revenue. Um, we do it to ensure, you know, to try to strike the balance between having parking available and having parking convenient. And uh, it's a tough balance to strike. It's an impossible balance to strike. But I will I will pass the the uh, notion on to planning department to take a look at. Yeah, and for at least for speaking with parking, because I think the question is: is a double parking a civil ticket or no, is it a criminal ticket? No, it, it, it it's is not criminal. It's civil. And there, it's not even civil. It's the a, great a violation. Thing is that there's plenty of opportunities to offer tickets for double parking, regardless of whether your parking enforcement is full time or part time, because people do it. All the time so yeah it's mostly in the evening oh no i wish that were not the case <laughs> mostly if, if i could just add that um one of the areas that parking enforcement has looked at is double parking so they are it might not appear so but they are issuing tickets for those as well um you know we can argue the merits of the full-time or part-time council member goalie uh but i will say the goal of the additional uh, position is to look at double parking. It's to look at my other pet peeve, which is individuals parking on the sidewalk as we go into North Central and into Lansingburg. Um, and then heading south as well. And up on the hill, I know uh, Council Member Steele, you have issues with parking in your neighborhoods as well. Um, it's to give us that additional flexibility. So I do wanna be clear that the new position is not just downtown. Council Member Gully. Um, <clears throat> or should I start? Hmm. First off, I think the flexible advantage of a part-time person is you can set the hours. So maybe you can set the hours three to nine instead of eight to five. Mm -hmm. Full-time person will be under union guard and it'd be a full-time position eight to five during a day. So if you really want to conquer the problem, you can set a part-time person and set his hours up differently. You can define his schedule. You can define his duties in the job description. And you have nothing to worry about. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing I was thinking is that we do have a problem. And, you know, and it's hard. We have residential parking. You take away from from a lot of different aspects. And I don't want to, I, I certainly don't want to think that the tickets are revenue generators. I would hope that they were educational lessons. And I just think that the educational lesson isn't strong enough because people continue to do that. And we've seen some people who double park because they there's a necessity, the street is taken up. But then we see the ignorance in some that just park right in front of an open spot. It won't be courteous enough to move in for traffic, which, which really kind of drives everybody crazy. But here's the other thing. When you see it, you can't always have a police on every corner. So they have to catch what they can, and our parking guys can catch what they can. So you can diversify that part-time guy, and we'll get them at night, too. Uh, this, but I was thinking as far as residential parking, maybe if we could look at possibly do we have a couple of lots or maybe a couple of, you know, really bad buildings or somewhere that you can maybe take, like, those gaping spots in a block and turn them into a residential parking lot so it doesn't it doesn't impact the parking on the street for the businesses, but you make a private lot with these old decrepit buildings or these useless lots with some blacktop and we and we use it for a place to have resident parking and then you issue permits for those 
lots and over a period of time, at least we'll get the revenue from the sites on those lots more than what we would get for the lot at the auction, including the money I have to put into it. So if I, you I don't have, have, have you done any of those lots, point them out. Yes. Well, that's what I'm saying. I don't know what's out there, but you know, these guys, they come up, right? Maybe we got to start thinking about that now so that five, seven years from now, we've defined a spot for our residents in the city to have some sort of place to go to without having to get up, especially a person who works night, has to sit there all day and get up. Every, if they don't move their car to get a ticket, you know what I mean? They play, they play Russian roulette with the parking guy. Uh, so maybe we can do something like that or think like something like that moving forward that could help the residents and also uh, keep, keep peace with the businesses. So I know if we were to, we would still probably need state permission to do a residency permit program. Yeah. Um, our lots, you know, our parking facilities uh, are already at capacity. Right. Um, you know, and I will just say anecdotally, uh, when a vacant property comes up, especially in the downtown area, I think it tends to be uh, picked up by a private developer, um, you know, as opposed to being turned, and the community doesn't want to necessarily see it turned into a parking lot, but it's certainly something Unless that we could look at moving on. Say we're going to park. And they say, "Well, oh, that's great." Well, so there's two sides of that coin. Council President, Council Are, Member Steele. If if Councilman Gully's done, I oh, am. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I can I can share from from uh, experience on my own block that that's great in theory, uh, but it doesn't work. People um, in our neighborhood they literally created a uh, parking lot in the backyard. So what used to be green space is now a park. However, they still park on the street because it's faster to get into your car from the front door than having to walk all the way around the house. Can you imagine all those extra steps you have to go? Um, I, I, I agree. It sounds, it sounds great in theory. It sounds great in theory, but in practice, uh, I, I can tell you, in practice, it, 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 it doesn't work. And um, we've heard from folks in... Uh, uh, neighbors in on Fifth Avenue who had the opportunity to have a parking lot and they didn't want it. They did not want, they wanted to retain the green space. So, um, they get tickets parked. Great, great in theory, but doesn't always well, work. So, I, you know, I, I, not to, not to downplay your idea, but I just want to uh, offer the other side of the coin. Oh, listen, we're all about pushing out ideas Council here. Member Gully. While one may be good, one may be not so good, but our job is to put all these ideas on the table to see what might work. And who knows, as we say, we're a growing city. We're a growing city. We have more movement than any other city, I think, around us. And I think that we have to think seven, 10 years out. Not, And it's not necessarily what, because nobody likes change. Nobody enjoys change because they don't know what to expect, only what they have. But I think that sometimes somebody has to have a vision and they have to think about some ideas because if not, they'll still be arguing at these tables next year, the year after that, and every year going forward on the same things. And that's what I've noticed over my seven years. We talk about the same things all the time. <laughs> Why don't we try working on a carrot? Just want, let's just focus and get get something done. Yeah. We, we talk about the same things every year. So I I enjoy being here and I enjoy bringing out my ideas. I hope they don't offend anybody. If they do, come and talk to me. We'll talk about it. Uh, it's all good. Council President. Yes. Okay. Council Member Man. The last piece on parking. What I will do and and try to reach out with our parking um, our parking department and, and council is I will work with uh, both the bid and downtown business businesses and organizations that do have parking lots that are not utilized in the evening to see if they might be willing to create some kind of a, a, a partnership. They may not mm -hmm. have I'm thinking like a lot of our church lots and even in speaking with the president of Sage, he said, you know, one of the services that benefits that Sage as a nonprofit brings back to the city of Troy besides maintaining Sage Park is you can use their lots evenings and weekends. They are available mm -hmm. to the public, but there's not great signage. And so that may be one of those things where like as we're developing our city parking maps, if there are organizations, churches, community groups, schools, who know they can open their parking up to permitted known people, um, that that may alleviate some of that pressure. Um, 
That's a great idea. I'm going to tell you why after you're Council done. Council member Gully. No, no. Are you all set? Well, Council that, member Gully. That would be a great thing. I mean, you could get community organizations to do that, and maybe each person that would utilize that as a resident would do a donation to that organization would make it win-win for both. I don't think it actually set a fee for the parking, but they could have would do that too. But being a nonprofit, they might not be able to do that. But what about getting the individuals who would use a lot to donate something back to the organization for use of a lot, which would give them a medallion from the organization to be in their lot? I mean, win-win, I think. But Partnerships. Maybe you can't okay. do that. Because no. no, you can You can do that, definitely. There's a, Chris reminded me, there's a church on Lark Street that does that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Why not? Uh, I mean, that would serve two purposes. Yeah. Council President? Yes, Council well, Member uh, Figueroa. Just like uh, I think it's that church on Hoosick, they have that contract with the bank across the street. That That's right. Allow them to park there. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. partnerships. Um, ENV, switching back to the budget. See, uh, it's okay. Two million ARPA. How do you plan over the next year to put that where it's needed? Right now, it's just two mil. Do you plan to do, you know, budget, um, you know, legislation? Like, how do you plan to? Once it's in the approved budget, it's like any other revenue. So there won't be amendments or items coming back. Um, I envision using it on an operational needs basis. Uh, it's matched up in the first instance primarily by the one-time expenditures, the police vehicles, things of that nature. Yeah. And then where it gets expressly pointed to for the treasurer reporting will be evaluated on an as as needed basis. Okay. Okay. Very good. Any other discussion questions? Council resident? Yes. Um just going back to um the ARPA funds for the small business. Um I don't know if you guys ever reached out. Um they have a great partnership with TRIP. The community loan fund they do have some background in regards to small businesses and grants and that yeah. for so that probably would be a good resource and that judge. that's actually one of the organizations we were talking to okay or All at right. least steve and dylan are talking yeah, steve yes and, yep yep yep, yep after, so um, great suggestion yeah definitely keep us um just surprised on that obviously and that's why you know i think the spreadsheet will be super helpful for all of us. Um, the community loan fund there, did they do the CDBG? Um, I thought that there was a business. They did, yeah. yes. Yep. Yeah, the CARES. Yep. yep. Okay. Very Council good. President. Yes, Council Member Soriento. So, um, seeing that the city engineer is leaving, are we going to be filling that position? We'll we certainly hope to. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Um, okay. Um, and then uh, going back to the law law department. So you indicated that um, you didn't want to put, and correct me if I am wrong, indicated that you didn't want to put someone in the position because it's only going to be there for a year. Is that for the that full-time well, it's not that I don't want to put somebody in no. there. It, it's that it, people are less inclined to make that commitment. Mm -hmm. It's a big commitment. And um, yes, that that's that position that's funded in the budget. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Good. Any other questions, observations? I Really want to thank, um, obviously, the mayor, the administration, my colleagues. Um, you know, it's a long process, obviously. And um, so over the next few days, um, Andy will send an email to all of us just with a timeline for the amendments. I think Monday morning, um, COB on Monday. And, you know, so I will make sure I copy all of you. Um, on the city council clerk's office, the city clerk's office, I should say. And, um, you know, any other amendments, obviously, we'll copy our colleagues. Okay. Um, I'll take a motion to adjourn. All right. We have a motion by council member Steele. Second. And a second by council member Conley Wilson. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 
Awesome. Carmelo. Ian T., very nice.